through growing pains through the book of James together. It's a painful book, isn't it? Hits you where it hurts sometimes, doesn't it? (laughs) So we're going to continue reading through chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, as you are turning there to to James 1. Uh, Just another quick announcement about our Vespers, our evening prayer and scripture reading, which happens on Sunday nights. This will be the second week. Last week we were in the library. This week we're going to meet up here. We're going to kind of have some chairs up here and read through some scriptures, have some time of, of silent prayer and prayer, and it's just going to be a good time. So that's going to be all throughout the semester. You know, if there's a Sunday morning that you miss for service here, um, you're welcome to come to Vespers. You can come to Vespers anytime you want to. Just kind of a laid back, casual time of just reading through some scriptures. We'll have a little bit of discussion and, like I said, some prayer time. So today's message is continuing in the theme of growing up, and so the title is Growing Up Means Growing in Obedience, and so we're going to listen to what James has to say, and I know for some of you, if you've been here on uh, Wednesday nights with D6, Pastor Cindy's been talking about these things, and so I'm sorry if this is like a double jab to you. I've heard some some good discussion from, from your Wednesday night groups. So here we go, and and actually what we're going to do is I'm not going to read the entire passage. We're going to break it down into three parts, and so I'm going to read first from verses 19 through 21, so just keep your place there in James chapter 1 throughout the message. First of all, we're going to see that James gives us a caution sign, and so let's read about this caution sign that James gives us. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So last week we talked about facing temptation, persevering through temptation. And so immediately, now James talks about anger. Do you think Jesus, or do you think James wanted to connect temptation with maybe the temptation to get angry? Perhaps that was first thing on James's mind as he's thinking about his Christian community that he's writing to. And so in verse 19 of the text, the NIV starts off with this, take note of this. So literally, you know, if if you're taking notes, like, write it down. Uh, The ESV says, know this. Let this be something that you know. And then I like the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, says, you know this. So it's interesting from these these different versions here. One says, take note of this. The other one says, know it, and the other one says, you already, <laughs> you already know this, and what, what is he saying? You know that everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You know this. We know this. We know firsthand, either by way of our own actions through anger or through the actions of others who have been angry, that human anger doesn't produce anything good in us, and it doesn't produce anything good in the world. There's an a article that I read a few years ago on anger, and uh, a writer for the New York Times a few years ago named Maggie Scarf, she says this. This is one of my favorite definitions or illustrations of the danger of anger, and I'll have the words on the screen. Getting angry can sometimes be like getting into a wonderfully responsive sports car gunning the motor, taking off at a high speed, and then discovering the brakes are out of order. (laughs) It sounds good getting into the sports car, wonderfully responsive sports car, taking off at a high rate of speed if that's your thing, but then it just ends tragically there when you realize that the speed to which you're going, you have no ability or very limited ability, let's put it that way, to pull back from what we started. And so anger feels really good, like hopping into that that sports car, until we realize that once it gets going, it's very hard for us to actually control our anger. And once it gets going, and if it goes unchecked, then our anger will control us 
and take us for a ride that we didn't expect. Paul says this about anger in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, in your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not, I think this is key, do not give the devil a foothold. Do not give the devil the opportunity to co-opt your anger and turn it into something that you never imagined it would become. Now, anger is a human emotion. We all experience that emotion from time to time. It's inevitable for us to feel anger, but James and Paul would just simply hold up a caution sign for us like many of our other emotions. Let's not let them carry us away, but let the Word of God keep those things in check. Invite the Holy Spirit to to be our strength in the face of facing and feeling anger. And so, verse 21, Paul goes on to say, get rid of all the moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the Word planted in you which can save you. So, James gives us some, some good news. In the face of the news that our anger can be destructive on us and our world, he says we can swap out our anger for God's word, the truth of God's word. We, we, can, we can take the, the evil that's within our hearts, the darkness within our hearts that can so easily take control of our anger, and we can trade that in for the planted word. We can humbly accept God's planted word in place of the anger that we feel. Last week in verse 18, as we were reading in James, James says that God chose to birth us through the word of truth that we might become a first fruits of all he created. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 17. This is one that I'm sure most of you know, where Paul said, everyone in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And so if you are in Christ, there is hope for you to be able to face and deal and, and, and battle with the anger that so easily wants to come in and control you. And so the caution sign is don't let anger get the best of you. Don't jump into that sports car and gun it because the brakes don't work. So we have the caution, and now we have a blessing from verses 22 through 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do." They will be blessed in what they do. We, we have been born of the word of truth, as James has told us. Born of the word of truth, and the word of truth resides in us. God's law has been written on our hearts and our minds through the Holy Spirit. And last week in James, I mentioned that, actually at the beginning of the series, I talked about how James sounds so much like Jesus. You read James's words, and in particular, you'll notice that James's letter looks a lot like the Beatitudes that we find in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 and in some of the other Gospels. And what James is telling us and what Jesus tells us in the Beatitudes as well is that to follow in the way of Jesus, to decide to live like Jesus in this world is to live counterculturally, to live in an upside-down way in this world compared to the ways of the world. Following Jesus is very much like what we found in the Beatitudes a couple years ago when we went through the Beatitudes that Jesus pronounces a blessing upon those who are poor, those who seek justice and righteousness in our world, those who are meek, those who are peacemakers in our world, those who are merciful and pure in heart, and even the persecuted. Jesus says people who live in these ways and practice these ways, they are blessed. And then at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, if you'll remember, Jesus says these words. Therefore, anyone or everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into, here's the key word, 
practice. It's like a man who built his house on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So the blessing that James gives us matches the blessing that Jesus gives us, and it's a blessing for those who practice the way of Jesus. Because the way of Jesus is a solid foundation for us to stand upon when the storms come. And of course, the last two weeks, what did we talk about? We talked about persevering through trials and temptations. And so when the winds and the waves of life come against us, if we practice the ways of Jesus, we are standing on solid ground. Much harder to be moved than if we were to be standing on a foundation of sand. And so James puts this way, since we were born of the word of truth, that's our origin into the Christian life, and since God's truth lives within us, to know God's truth, to to know it in here and to not obey it is like the person who sees himself in a mirror, goes away from the mirror, and immediately forgets what they look like, forgets their image in the mirror. I don't know about you, but there are days when I look in the mirror and I don't like what I see, and that stays in my brain all day. I'm like, oh my, I mean, my hair today is just crazy, right? (laughs) My goodness, getting a little out of control. (laughs) James says, whoever looks intently, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, he says, they will be blessed in what they do. So if you hear the word and you put it into practice, he says, there's a blessing that goes along with that. And talking about this idea of the, the law that gives perfect freedom, what, what does that mean? What, what does that mean for a law to give perfect freedom? N.T. Wright says it this way, N.T. Wright, who is a scholar on the New Testament, he says, in some countries, we drive on the right side of the road. In other countries, we drive on the left side of the road. But in America, if you are dead set on driving on the left side of the road, you won't get very far before running into obstacles. You could decide that you hate the right side of the road and it feels constricting to you, and you never want to follow that law until eventually you suffer the consequences. There's freedom in following the law and the laws of God, because it generally leads to blessing and to life and to goodness, even though storms and tough times may still come. And so we would say today this blessing that Jesus' way is the blessed way to live. It is the only sure foundation for us to stand upon in this life. And so as we talk about growing up in obedience, perhaps obedience isn't so much something that we do out of just feeling like we have to in order to get good brownie points, but because we know to walk in the way of Jesus is to ensure that we stand on solid ground no matter what comes our way in this life. And so we got the caution sign against anger, we got the promise of a blessing for following the way of Jesus, and then finally James gives us a call to action. Verse 26 through 27, he says, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So think about James his original audience, who he's writing to. What prob- when, you, when you read some of what James says, what problems do you think James is addressing in that community of faith? Do you think, can, can you imagine a community of believers that James is writing to who started off passionately and earnestly following Jesus, but over time, maybe trials and tribulations, as we've been talking about, came their way and caused them to relax and wore them down. And perhaps in the face of these trials and tribulations, perhaps this community of faith, they forgot the words of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount about anger in our minds leading to murder, perhaps. 
Can you, can you imagine a, a community of believers that James is writing to, and he says, listen, where you once started off, things were good, but over time, Satan is wearing you down. It's time to get back to these principles that Jesus taught us. So like the illustration of getting into the sports car, or maybe for James's time, maybe getting into a four-horse chariot, maybe that was their sports car of the time. James wants them to understand that if they let their anger get the best of them, if they let it go unchecked, that their anger and their tongue will control the trajectory of their life. Now, James, he's going to have much more to say about the tongue in later chapters, so we're just going to just take this rebuke, this warning from James, knowing that we've got more to deal with later on, I believe, in chapter 3. But can we think also of this statement from James where he says, those who do not have a handle on their tongue, he says their religion is worthless. And when he says religion, the Greek word for religion is someone who says that I'm a God-fearer or someone who says I'm a God-worshipper. He says in essence that if, if the fruits of our relationship with Jesus aren't evident in the way that we talk to people, then he says that kind of religion that says I'm religious, but then you don't see the fruit of it, it's pointless, it's, it's useless, it's worthless, he says. And so all of us get to sort of sit with that. I think we all get to sit with that. And I don't get to point fingers at anyone in this room today because I find myself sitting with these words from James being challenged and knowing too often I have been careless with my words, my words that I speak out in person and my words that I type out on social media or maybe in a text and all of the different ways that we communicate. Think about James and his community of believers, and not just maybe they were having issues with their anger and their speech, but perhaps this community of, of believers that Jesus is, or that James is writing to, maybe over time they became lazy and they became calloused. And maybe once when they first started off as a Jesus follower, they served the poor in their community and they served the, the welfare of those in, in their church community. Maybe they were known for their acts of generosity and, and goodness where they lived, but perhaps over time they grew calloused to the needs of the world and the city that they were living in. They knew Jesus' words about being salt and light, giving to the poor and standing up for the vulnerable, but it sounds like James's community at some point went off the rails. They, they left that, that path of Jesus' words, the, the blessed way of following after Jesus, and they let anger control them. And they became calloused. To the needs of the people around them. It sounds like James's community of Christians were all talk and no action. Another way of putting that could be all hat and no cattle. You heard that one? Or all hammer and no nail. All icing and no cake, although that's not the worst situation to be in right there. <laughs> So, yeah. Someone told me a few weeks ago, for, you always work food into your messages. <laughs> well, there you go. So, so here's your to-go. Here's your take-out thought from this message. And this is an anonymous quote. I don't know who said it. I've just seen it all over the place. When you are washing feet, you are too busy to throw stones. Another way of putting that is, and maybe you've heard this, idle hands are the devil's playground. And so when we have too much time on our hands, we're not being productive and following in the way of Jesus and living in the kingdom of Jesus, the devil will find ways to, to work into our life and trip us up with anger and trip us up with the ways that we use our speech, and perhaps cause us to settle into a comfortable Christianity that is blinded to the difficulties and the needs and the struggles of people around us. And so if we're washing feet, if we're being like our master, like our servant Jesus, perhaps there's less room for Satan to come in, tempt us to throw stones, 
or just to sit by and watch the world waste away. So let me invite you to take that to-go nugget and chew on it this week. Ask Jesus to give you opportunities to lead you into ways of washing the feet of people in this world. As we continue to grow together through the book of James, may God add a blessing to the hearing and the doing of his word. Let's pray. Lord, we've received your word for us. Your word is truth. Your word is life. Your word is a lamp unto our feet above any other word that we listen to or words that we create. Father, as we dedicate ourselves as a Christian community to following in the blessed way of of Jesus, we know that we don't always get it right. We know we sin, as Cindy said in our in, in the communion message. We we all sin. And so we do ask in this moment for your grace. Not so that we can go back to the same attitudes and actions and temptations, but that we might be picked up and we might be strengthened in the way of Jesus. Living like you, growing, growing up into maturity, as you would have us to do. And Lord, as, as we do grow up into maturity in this place. I pray that you would cause each one of us to have a light that's burning in our soul, that's evident to all around us, that can see there's something, there's something different about those people who attend Wyatt Park. There's something different about the way that they live and the way that they talk, the way that they handle themselves on social media. Father, we thank you for the blessed way. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.